Welcome into the Ian S. Hoover Show. I got my buddy Jason back with me for a double take. Double take, yeah. This is uh, this is gonna be even better the second time around, but we should probably fill everybody in as to why this is round two. <laughs> well, I actually technically round three because I was on your show. That's true, right? That started off the party, and then you, and then I brought you into the recording studio for my show, and somehow we we messed up. I you shouldn't say we. I messed yeah. up. I didn't plug the computer in. It kind of started to die, so we took a pause. And we yeah. got it plugged back in before it died, but then somehow the recording messed up. You were knocking the dust off, as you had pointed out. It was coming Million. off the shelf for the first time in many months doing podcasting, so you're given a pass. It was a total bummer, though, because when that happened, I knew immediately how I was going to do a transition when I edited the show. It was going to be funnier than hell, but now well now it's all pristine so we get to bring okay. you back in and try a different whiskey this time so we yeah. are going with minor case rye, straight rye whiskey cheers cheers to you sir you've already tasted is any good it's pretty good i wish i God, i don't remember what we had the last time so i have no frame of we reference had, but uh, we're not a philadelphia kin kin something okay it's an easy sipper though i like this yeah it's not bad i'll be drinking uh buffalo trace tonight uh while i watch the uh the crap show of our United States elections go down. Not uh, to get too political. Well, yeah, thanks for saving the good stuff for the nominees and all the bullshit on TV. <laughs> right. So Jason Sircone, thank you for being here with us. I did yes. not butcher your name this time, right? You nailed it. See, second First time, time better. I like, uh, told you. Told you. And uh, Jason has a company called Bomb Track Media, which is a fucking awesome name. <laughs> not to start sir. cussing already, but it's a great name. And even better, if you haven't watched the show, go check it out because I love your intro. I love Thank your you. outro. It's just very well thought out and done and kind of shows you that like I put so much very little effort into <laughs> the setup of my podcast like i think i hired some guy on fiverr to create the little intro yeah. for me in like 10 seconds and it wasn't good but yeah uh, fantastic job by you thank you and i really love your content i've become uh part of the what's the nation called the bomb squad the bomb squad i've been i've, I've subscribed i listened to five or six episodes already <laughs> including not including the one that i was on which i did listen to yeah that was a great episode great conversation got good reviews people that told me they listened to it and that's typically how I gauge it. When I get mouth to mouth feedback, you know, people very seldom go on to Apple Apple Podcasts and leave a review anymore, unless it's real bad. That's just how we're wired for some reason. I don't know what it is, but I love when people come up to me or they send me a message saying, "Hey, loved your episode," and I got a couple of those with yours. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, did Did Bob listen? I don't. I did not get any feedback from him. So uh, I'm gonna have to bust his balls. You will. Yeah, so, um, but you didn't listen to our specifically episode. sent him the link so he could watch live, and I never heard anything back. <laughs> uh, so you, your company, Bob Track Media, is focused on the small business realm mm. and getting people a voice and a platform to kind of grow their business. So, talk to me a little bit about that and what you do at Bomb Track Media. Yeah, the whole idea behind Bomb Track Media was really, for me, it was an amalgam of 10 years of podcasting experience. And what I had gotten more into over the past few years is helping businesses do podcasting from a number of different approaches from whether they want to have their own show, maybe they want to be a podcast guest and go on established shows and make their presence down that way. It was just finding the right way for them to attack the medium. But with Bomb Track Media, what I wanted to do was start focusing in on more efficient ways for businesses to utilize podcast content because we, gosh, we, we, we have such a high failure rate in this industry. And a lot of it stems from not having the right strategy and not factoring in the time that it takes to physically sit down and do podcasting from start to finish. And if you're doing it all yourself, there's so many steps that you have to do. So I wanted to bring a uh, voice of advocacy to the power of podcasting, which I've been doing for the last 10 years, but also provide a service where I could help businesses understand how to do this better and then actually sit with them and help them create the content and then do all the back end work for them. So instead of having to do everything from editing and creating assets and producing everything for the social media and the blog and the web, you know, it's so much. And everybody's got so many things on their plate already when it comes to running their business. I wanted to be able to take a lot of that off their plate. So that's what me and my team do. And I focus in on seasons because it allows you to get real focused on your content. And then if you want to take a break, you can't. You don't feel like you have to be chained to your microphone every single week coming up with new content. 
focus on something that's hot in your industry or hot within your company that you help your customers with, put that information out there, continue to market that over a few month period and take a break from actually sitting down and producing. It makes all the difference. And we were connected with a good friend of mine, Nina, who yeah, is Nina's my awesome. favorite sweet shop, yes. which if you are not aware, if you are in the Pittsburgh area, go check out my favorite sweet shop. It is the best. I mean, mm, they have magic just, mountain bites. Yeah. Oh, I, my, my family's addicted to that. Anytime I think I anybody that up. touches those is addicted to those. I, They're so good. I'm not a peanut butter fan. That'll turn you into a peanut butter fan. I don't, I don't even like the smell of it. It's no. so weird. I was ruined. My mother ruined me of peanut butter. Oddly enough, she only bought the all natural, like Smucker's peanut butter. You had to stir up, had the oil on That's top garbage. and everything. Well, I got raised on that and now I'm ruined. I can't do anything with any kind of artificial peanut butter. It's so weird. Man, that feel I feel for you. But Nina has a bunch of fantastic sweets she outside really of that. And then if you're a business, they have all kinds of custom ingredient like custom uh things you can use for gifts and, and whatnot. So definitely go check that out in Carnegie, Pennsylvania. Thanks, Nina, Indeed. for linking us up. And oddly yeah. enough, it's such a weird timing because I literally was just like, man, I got to start creating content again. I took a break for about a year. I had some stuff going on in my life. And, and, uh, I mean, I literally was in the middle of, of editing of my first show back essentially, which was just a friend of mine who wanted to interview me about how politics affects real estate and all that. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, this will be a good transition to get back into it. And then I got an email from you, like as I'm editing and I'm like, <laughs> Wow, what a what a coincidence! Funny how the universe right? works. It's amazing. Stars aligning and everything. It was crazy. No, Nina told me she knew a guy that not only was looking to do some podcasting again, but has his own studio in his office. It's like hell yeah, I'd love to check that out. And here we are. And now I built one in my my home office. I just have to get a better. I have to get a cooler like backdrop or something to go with it. But yeah. I essentially have a mini version of this setup in my home office. So right on. Pretty happy about that. My favorite thing about you, though, Jason, other than the fact that we, we actually get along, I was like, we're going to be best friends by the end of this because now this is our third yeah, podcast. The idea like from month. the start, yeah, whether uh, you wanted to do that or not. Yeah, you're just going to be in my friend circle from now on. It's it's You have no choice. That's what was how it, the old T-Mobile top five? Yeah. Be in your fave five. My, my fave, five, <laughs> fave five. That's funny. I used to sell T-Mobile. I don't know if you know that. I did know that about you, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but my favorite thing about you is you have a fantastic origin story. As do I, right? Yeah, and right. I feel like we are who we are because of the the path that we chose, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I have a good friend of mine who's also his name is Jason. And we we had these long, like deep conversations. Like we drove to Atlantic City for his fortieth birthday, and uh, we just because I'm like, man, if I would have just made this change earlier in life, my life would be different. And he's like, yeah, but then we wouldn't be doing this together. Right? Right. And it's it's weird how just the universe works. But tell the people listening your origin story. Yeah, it's it's a good one. I mean, it, it, this all started for me back in two. I mean, I should go back even further. I mean, if I really want to go back in the timeline, I started my entrepreneurial pursuits when I was 13, completely by accident. And I was a big sports card collector. Were you ever into like football cards, yep. baseball cards? Oh, yeah. Okay, so me and my friends were huge into that around seventh grade, eighth grade. And right down the street from my house, there was a guy that had a card shop in his basement. So you just go around back and he'd have it all. Had, it was a great setup. And you're making a weird face. No, it wasn't. Yeah, there, it just no, there was nothing. Really it was all above bar. But no, this is, he was a really cool dude, and I actually got along with him really well. And he and he ended up being like, in my first fantasy football league. He was my partner because I I didn't have enough money to cover the entry fee because I was only 14. So he's like, I'll pay half if you can come up with the other half. So yeah, and he recently just passed away, but he was one of my first inspirations in regards to entrepreneurship because what ended up happening was just because I would go down there and like as soon as I get my allowance riding my bike down, buying sports cards and flipping cards. Like that was a big thing for us. We'd be playing poker for them or trying to sell them. I had them at school, selling them out of my locker. It was great. And he knew all this. And he said, listen, I've got a partner who has to, he has his, his partner can't be there. Could you potentially join him for the weekend at this card show? And you have to pay for the table, but you could set up your cards and whatever you sell, you keep the money. Like, Hell yeah. I had enough inventory to go around. So that's where it all began. I started selling cards officially from that point for about a year, a year and a half. And then sports cards started to become less a part of my life. And then fast forward, I did some radio in college, nothing major, just our, my uh, university of Pittsburgh at Bradford had a radio station. So that's where I guess the seeds of podcasting were first planted. Fast forward a few more years. I was in Pittsburgh and I was at a bar right before Pirates game, Mike's beer bar is what it's known as now. I love Mike's. Mike's is the, sh I love Mike's too. 
actually got to do some work with him later on after he bought the place. It was originally called the beer market when I was there the first time for this, where the story began. Sitting at the bar before a Pirates game, great crowd as always, because that's like the spot to go because it's right next to the stadium. Guy comes in, wants a Miller Lite, and they say, we don't sell Miller Lite. And he starts flipping out because he can't get a Miller Lite. And they said, well, we have other beers that are comparable. How about this? No, no. Give me a Bud Light. Right? No. Once again, we don't sell the mass produced we, big guy. We have here. Iron City Light. That's yeah. it. And then everything else is crap. Yeah. So they were trying to make suggestions. He he was very stubborn and finally landed on a yingling and was okay. As the bartender went to go get his beer, he just happened to be standing next to me. So I got to watch all this unfold. And he looked right at me and said, how the hell does this place think it's going to survive without Miller Light and Bud Light? And I just looked around and said, are you seeing what I'm seeing? This place is packed. I think they're going to be okay. And I don't understand why you're having such a problem with trying a different beer. And he's I was like, ah. so he was all mad at me now, got his beer and stormed off. And they literally have like a thousand beer. Choices. Like there's something for everybody there. You don't have to be completely prison in prison to Bud Light and Miller Light. There's a lot of beer out there. So I sat there for a few minutes and I was by myself. I was waiting for my girlfriend to join me. So I was just, with my thoughts. And I said, man, there's a lot of people that think like this guy. What can we do to change that? Because I was just starting to get into all that craft beer. The Pittsburgh beer scene has become a hotbed. Like mm -hmm. it's one of the best in the country. It wasn't that at the time. It was just starting to slowly become a thing. So I decided I wanted to start a blog, which was the thing then podcasting really wasn't on my radar and started the blog and slowly started to pick up some relationships just by going to bars and breweries and saying, hey, I'd like to write about you. Not charge them anything. Just let me write about you. They're like, yeah, that'd be great. So once things started to roll, I came up with an idea to create a mobile app. And the mobile app was designed to connect beer enthusiasts across Pittsburgh to events and happenings and beer releases and all this stuff. And that is what I took to the breweries and the bars and the restaurants and monetized and said, listen, this is what I'm thinking. It would cost you X amount per month and we can advertise everything you're doing through the app. We can create specials and we can do all, there's a very a lot of interactive things we can do through this app. And they loved it. So I picked up maybe 20, 25 partners, give or take, and did this obnoxious three week countdown to the app going live on the Apple store and in Android stores. And the day I launched it, this clown on Twitter just starts trolling me about what a horrible job I'm doing. Never heard Pete from this guy leading up to it. And I made it completely very well known what I was doing and he nothing until it went live. Then he just started tearing me apart. And having never experienced a troll before, I started arguing back and forth with him. And what? And then finally, I just in, in my head, I said, why does this guy get to have an opinion like so, so strong? And I went and looked at his profile and he just happened to be the host of a beer podcast. And me and my best friend had been kicking around ideas for starting a podcast. We just weren't sure what we wanted to do. And I, so that was it. I called my friend. I said, we're going to do a beer podcast and we're going to do it better than that guy. And he said, let's do it. So two weeks later, we sat down and we did our first podcast and we absolutely sucked at it. We were so bad and we did all the wrong things. We didn't think about what the structure should be. We were all over the map. We, one of my partners with the app was like, yeah, come record it at the bar. I was like, okay. It was trivia night, so it was noisy as hell in the background. We had a horrible listener experience. It was just one of those things that when I did it, I was doing it for the wrong reasons. But when I started, I was like, oh, I found my thing. I immediately was taken back to all the radio I did in college and all the fun I had with that. And I knew podcasting was what I wanted to do. And that's evolved a lot over 10 years. But here we are. And you have a bomb ass radio voice, by the way. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I need to I need to figure out which you probably could tell I'm still a little getting over this this sickness that my kids gave me. They're so nice. They they share that with <laughs> they're me. they're always not they're always thinking about themselves when it comes to oh, passing. Hundred percent. And my passing those germs around. My son, he's he's ten years old and he he's just that type where he just likes to get under people's skin just yeah. just to mess with you. Sure. Like he I'm raising him right to be a cow. Okay, maybe it's not right, but he's. A, I'm raising him to be a Cowboys fan, and he just oh, like that's wrong. We it, gotta talk with this. Boy. And he just anytime he wants to, he just goes off the rails and starts telling me he's an Eagles fan or a 49ers fan. I, he like, should. I listen. He you set him up for a lifetime of disappointment. My I was my dad's a Bills fan. I was in a similar household, and I ended up jumping to the Steelers when I was like ten. 
You know what? When when we win the Super Bowl, and it's when it's gonna happen in my lifetime again. It's probably gonna be after Jerry dies. But when we win the Super Bowl, <laughs> it's gonna feel so rewarding that I stayed on the bandwagon yeah. that long. Okay, I am loyal. I love the TikToks where it's like, you know, you got a loyal man when they like the Lions or the Cowboys, you know, like those type of things. Cause yeah, I have a know. friend that's a Lions fan. He's stuck with them. They're so fun to watch years. right now. Now they're great. I Fantastic. mean, good Lord, it took them long enough to get here. Are you kidding me right now? What is that? It's like our video just dropped. So I, I guess I'm bringing the bad vibes. The you house. are you're cursing us right now. The, that's so wrong. Uh, I'm so pro podcast. You think the that podcast I can bring expert in the good is vibes. here, and uh, and my and my setup is failing us. I don't know what the deal is, man. And that's I as we as I complimented you when I first saw it, and when we got started, you've got a hell of a setup here. I this should not be happening. This should, <laughs> this should all not be good. Positive nor stuff. has it happened before in the past. By the way, uh, this is my. Once this goes live, this will be my 51st episode. All right. I just realized that because uh, uh, Spotify tells me how many episodes I've done. That's if you include my real alternation stuff in there. Too. Okay. So I'm well, essentially, I'm well over 10x of, of the average Yeah, so podcast. considering most people get between three and 10, yeah, you're doing very that, well. That's what blew my mind when I started listening to your podcast is when, when you said that like the average podcaster doesn't make it to the third episode. That's so sad. Unbelievable. Yeah, it really I mean, is. it it's there's so many layers to that too that I just don't understand, especially if you're doing it for your company, because more than likely you spent tons of time promoting that you were doing this episode or you're doing this podcast and you're going to do all this great stuff. And, but at three episodes later, you're kind of like <laughs> we're moving on to something else, I guess. Because again, it, it comes down to not knowing the strategy, not understanding the work that's involved, and really just throwing something out there to see if the world shows up to listen, which isn't what happens. Not in the very beginning. You have yeah. to take time to develop the structure and, and get people invested in what you're bringing them week over week. And that's when things start to take off. But it doesn't happen in the first few episodes, that's for sure. That's just the foundation. I will say that I think your biggest challenge in your business, which I love your business model, by the way. Thank I think you. it's great. I think it's a, a great idea. And I think it's... Oh, I think you can make a lot of money and be very successful with it, especially mm -hmm. if you were to like kind of build it up and eventually be, you know, nationwide type, which I'm sure you. you, you oh know. yeah. I've got scaling strategies. Yeah, for scaling sure. strategies. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think it's a great idea, but I think your biggest hurdle is just that the mindset of people, especially young people in yeah. today's day and age is instant gratification. Yeah. No, now, are you a blackjack guy? Uh, I'm more a poker guy, but I, you have I'm, played. Blackjack. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. So my buddy Jason and I, we went to Atlantic city him and I have two on one specific thing, have two completely different mindsets. And that's when you double. Okay. When okay. you double, for those of you who don't know blackjack, when you have a good hand and the dealer has a not so good hand, or if you just have an 11, it's just an automatic double, no matter Absolutely. what. When you double, the dealer gives you the option whether you want the card up so you see what your hand is, or if you want the card down. I'm a big person on I want the card up because I like to set myself up for expectations mm -hmm. automatically on the spot. I'm a millennial. I want instant gratification. If I hit 21, I'm celebrating. If I get a three, I'm I'm pissed, right? <laughs> and I'm just hoping and praying the dealer busts, right? Mm -hmm. And he wants the card down because in his theory is the odds are in his favor that he's going to win that hand and he doesn't want to see it. So we go back and forth on that all the time. And I bust his ball. And I say he gambles like a 60 year old and I gamble like a 20 year old. Right. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's just one of our things. But I, I think that nowadays the, the mindset of the population is I'm going to do this podcast to be rich and famous. Yeah. And when they don't, when they, when they put that podcast out there and they get five listeners or 10 listeners or zero listeners, mm -hmm. maybe they get lucky and they get 150 listeners. I bet that's still not good enough for 99% of people starting a podcast. And the, the fact of the matter is unless you're willing to pay for it, which we talked a little bit about pay for, and we'll get back into that because obviously our, our show didn't record. We're having technical difficulties folks mm -hmm. in my beautiful studio that I built out and have recorded many episodes in. Uh, not only the e &S Uber show, but also uh, the, you know, Two Dads Drink, my my goof off show that we did for a couple seasons there. Uh, but I think that the people are just impatient. I think they want to be Joe Rogan overnight. Yeah. And number one, you're let's set up. Let's just set the ground rule right now. You're never going to be Joe Rogan. No, 
You're did, did you host Fear Factor? Are you a stand-up comedian? Well, I'll tell you. Did you watch Donald Trump's interview? I did. On, okay. And he, I, I love that for so many reasons. That episode was great. But if you remove politics from it completely, Trump asked Rogan directly, do you think your show is so successful because of your affiliation with UFC? And Joe said, yeah. Yeah. And then he asked, okay, do you feel like you'd still have your podcast if it weren't for your affiliation? He said, absolutely, I would. But what he accredited all of his success to was the fact that he had built his brand within television and mm -hmm. comedy for years. Prior to doing Prior to yeah. doing the podcast. And then what he didn't mention was how long that podcast took. That episode, I think, was 2,220, right. if I'm recalling the numbers. Yeah, Rogan started, I think, episodes... like, what, 2010, I think he started Yeah, podcast. so he was doing this. Well, I mean, podcasting was still, it was a thing, but it isn't what it is today. And it isn't as accepted as and, and as mainstream as it is today. And he did episodes in his basement with his friends. They were just goofing off and having a good time, enjoying the medium, enjoying what they were putting together. And his credibility and notoriety slowly led to some names wanting to join them. All of a sudden, the snowball started rolling downhill. But he didn't quit because after five episodes, well, shit, I'm not as famous. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, it's a different story with Joe Rogan, but that's the like. Me and my friend Alex talked about this on my show. If you're thinking that you want to be the next Joe Rogan, get that out of your mind right now and be the first you because you already have that locked down. 100%. That is already taken. No one can take that from you. Focus on your message and how loudly you're shouting that message. And the right people are going to show up to listen to it, but you can't just expect them to show up on day one. You have to you have to show that you're there for them. Yeah, you're, you're not a celebrity. No. Right? Uh, not at all. Maybe a local celebrity for some people, but you're not a celebrity you don't have a huge following more mm -hmm. than likely when you're starting a podcast. None of, that, none of that. And this is when I'm working with anybody, the first thing we address is mindset. And right. that's why, because if that is the mindset, we either have to break it or we're probably not going to get along in this production because you have to think differently. Start on the small end and we're going to build towards maybe someday you do become famous. Maybe you do go viral and the right things start to fall into place, but you have to be committed to putting the content together to make that happen. If you think it's just going to happen because, well, I'm starting a podcast, eh? everyone would have done that by now. The, the funny thing is, though, is I, is, as you know, I am the type of person that I, if I'm going to do anything, I'm setting out for success, right? Well, and, sure, sure. And so it should be. for me, I do, I have to almost not look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. That's good practice. And don't get me wrong, like my, my show is okay. I get some decent views and I get some feedback and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, especially because I haven't been any bit consistent really over the last five years. Yeah, that doesn't help either. But the fact that I've gotten to 50 episodes, I'm, I'm pretty happy with where we're at. But like, if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to do it to, to eventually make it big. Right? Oh, I, yeah, that's the thing. Like having those expectations is fine expecting it to happen just because you started today and it didn't or it's supposed to happen today. That's wrong. That that's not going to make you happy. And typically when people, when I ask people, like, I try to reverse engineer that question a lot and ask, listen, okay. If you were to open up your podcasts host tomorrow, logged in and the first thing was staring you in the face was 10,000 downloads on your show. What now? What are you going to do now? Record another one. <laughs> Well, I hope that that's yeah. obviously going to be, oh, okay, we're onto something. Yeah. But, but it really has right? an answer to that because, right. again, it's just the expectation. I don't fault anybody. It's how society has driven social media and all of this digital media into our minds. It's all about massive results, massive downloads, lots of likes, lots of retweets, lots of reshares, whatever. It's all vanity. It's supposed to make you feel good. So I always say, okay, if that's what you see, what are you going to do with that? And everybody's kind of, uh, I don't know. Because again, like every, because yeah. again, no one's starting your podcast just to get downloads. That's just a byproduct of producing something that hopefully is going to serve your brand and serve you and make you happy and give you something to enjoy creating. Absolutely. That's where it's at. To me, if you think about that mindset first, all, everything else falls into place, but you got to be committed to doing it right. And my overall mindset is that I, I think my, I obviously I have a real estate broker just going fantastic mm -hmm. and we have a great crew of people we're over 60 agents we're the largest local independent brokerage in town which uh looking back at it kind of blows my mind because like awesome. I, I i 
Well, I had high aspirations. I never thought that we would be to where we're at. Yeah. Right? I really didn't. I just I would have thought, okay, well, maybe. And how many years of hard work does that take? Eight years. There you go. Yeah, eight years of hard work to grind it out. And mm -hmm. we're just now getting to the point where, like, outside of, like, brand new people or people who are referred to us are willing to come check out our brokerage, which is kind of cool. Like, the phone's actually just ringing on its own, which is fun. Awesome. Uh, but I think, like, I've, I've told you, I have until I'm 50, right? And, mm -hmm. and then somebody else has to take over and run the thing and I could be like an advisor and I'm going to move on to something else. And one of the things, one of the ideas I have in my head is like maybe public speaking. I enjoy talking. Yeah. I enjoy training. I enjoy helping people in public speaking. So that's why I wrote a book and I'm probably going to write more books and I'm, I do my podcast and it's just kind of building that resume so that when the day comes that I'm done with real estate, and I'm moving on to my next career. I already have a catalog of of expertise that I can throw out there. But honestly, the the older I get, and you and I have had this conversation, the older I get, and the the closer I am to staring, let's just call it what it is, death in the face. We're yeah. all going to die someday, right? It could mm -hmm. be tomorrow, and or it could be 25 years down the road or 50 years down the road. I, I hope it's a lot longer, but. Mm -hmm. I have, I have children and eventually I'm going to hopefully have grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that this information is going to go anywhere. I think it's just always going to be out there. And we see it in a negative way with politics, like where with like JD Vance, for instance, where they're pulling stuff from like his college years and using it against him and stuff like that. Yeah. But in a positive way, my kids and my grandkids, maybe even my great grandkids will be able to go and watch my content in my my legacy lives on. I could mm -hmm. tell them, you know, I, that I love them, even though I never met them or whatever the situation yeah. is. And that's a really cool thought process. So I think if you think about the bigger picture and what you're leaving the legacy behind, even if you don't make a dime off your podcast, and even if you only record 20 episodes, at least you got that. Yeah. And then your family can always watch that when you, when you're gone. And uh, right. I, I'm actually living through it right now. Cause my, my son, he, he's named after my great grand grandfather, who was a huge role model in my life. His name is Roman. Mm -hmm. And my son's like writing a, a paper on him and he's supposed to have a photo. We're just having trouble even finding a photo there of him go. nowadays. I moved so many times and my mom's moved so many times and like we we have found some photos now, but it took a little while to find some photos. And it's like, man, I can't even find a photo of somebody who meant that much to me. Crazy. I hear you. But my my family will be able to have all this content mm -hmm. that uh like it or or hate it. They're they're at least gonna be able to say, Oh, that's what his voice sounded like, that's what he looked like, that's what he believed in, you know, yeah. all that stuff. So no, I, I, I'm with you there. I, I have, I've said it oftentimes. I remember every Sunday night, my grand, as long as I re could remember back when I was a little kid, we always used to go to my great grandparents' house on Sunday nights. And that was at that point, it was everybody, so all the cousins. Like, I mean, there was, they had this little house and there was 20 some people packed into it every Sunday night. One, one TV, one little TV in the living room, one little TV in the kitchen. Everybody just sort of went off on their own little place but that's what we did every sunday kids would all go play together adults would all hang out well then when they passed everybody sort of split into let's just go in our with their own little family so every sunday we started going to my grandparents house and the stories and the just the the, the fun we had i think back about all of it but for the life of me i can't remember a specific thing we talked about i just remember we were always laughing our asses off having fun if i could have captured any of that to look to, to just have those memories to go back and maybe pour a glass of bourbon and just sit and listen. Be Clark, Clark Griswold in the attic. Uh, yeah, exactly. Just crying and watching home <laughs> videos. Yeah. 100%. Exactly, exactly. Right. And we do have some home videos and there is that part of it. But I just think that, you know, from a podcasting perspective, whether you're doing it for your business, whether you're doing it for something you're passionate about, whether it's both, it's something that people can hold on to and the internet's written in ink. As long as you're not taking that down, it's out there and it's going to be consumable. Even if it doesn't live on the internet, maybe you have it on a hard drive somewhere that somebody can just plug in and listen to. There's a lot of value in it, but I, you know, I, I look at the business side of things first, because for me with bomb track media, a big thing I didn't mention that I should have, not only is it the podcast content, it's repurposing all of it because businesses have a number of boxes that they're looking to check in order in, in order to reach their audience. So they could be looking to do that through their website, through their blogs, through videos, through social media, through email. 
you can take all that content from a podcast episode. And that's something that I think blows a lot of minds because podcast content is so incredibly versatile. If you take one episode, you can extract all of this thanks to all the tools we have at our disposal. And I can give you content for everything. Now you don't have to work so hard. It's, okay, today we're going to produce blogs. Today we're going to do social media. And then, no, like, let's just make a podcast, repurpose the crap out of it. And here you go. Here are all these assets that you need to market your brand and make yourself visible and show people why you're the answer they've been looking for. Huge. And I think back to like early when we started our brokerage and like my, my partner, he was the, I guess the name recognition, right? Not that I wasn't successful prior to starting the brokerage, but he was the one that had been in the business 30 years. And everybody knew who he was and mm-hmm. stuff like that. That's why I felt it was important to have him involved in, in uh, the business. And he's, he's a great mentor of mine. We, you know, we were bringing on clients to feed to our agents essentially and he had essentially like a word uh, document that he would send to new clients and have them fill it out so that like it would just skip a lot of time on like answering questions, setting expectations, all that. But nowadays with like the internet, like you could do a podcast and then you could break that up into short like training informational stuff. And then you could say, hey, go review these 10 videos and then answer these five questions. And now you just, yeah. you know, so there's so many different ways to monetize and, and get value out of a podcast. So if you're not currently doing it, reach out to my boy, Jason, <laughs> get it going. Cause it's, it's, it is important for business and really just, yeah. even if you want to do a personal podcast, it's just important to, for everything to kind of get out there and, and not be afraid and do your understand thing. what you're getting into. Exactly. Yeah. I'll tell you, this is something that to speak to your point, Ian, I saw this on threads, a guy made a comment and it said, podcasts aren't even a thing anymore. They're just short form clips on social media. Mm. Now I could not disagree more because I feel all of it's relevant because I do too. it's all about where you're at in the moment. Those social media clips are great for when you're on social media, but when you're in your car right. and you're driving and you, what you shouldn't be doing is scrolling through TikTok or Instagram, you, you could use your car as a mobile university. That's why I call mine. Cause I always listen to podcasts to learn stuff. Yep. And that's more long form content that I can consume in a lot. Cause I'm gonna have a longer time in the car. Everybody has been consuming these different forms of content for years. We just have more mediums and more tools in which to consume it now. So that content or that comment was ignorant as hell, but it was very telling because it tell, it showed that, okay, this guy's looking at this and saying, okay, the, I could see his point, yeah, but he's exactly. not thinking about the big picture. I don't fully disagree because of the fact that I get way more impressions on, let's just say TikTok mm-hmm. than I do on my podcast. Mm-hmm. However, TikTok can feed my podcast and my podcast can feed my TikTok. And vice well, and that's the idea. I'm getting it. When you're doing it for your business, it doesn't matter. As right. long as it makes people aware of who you are and it makes them want to do business with you, you've achieved your purpose. 100%. That came through TikTok. You're going to be upset? No. Hell no. All right. So it's time to grill you, Jason. And I'm going to switch you it up a little bit. grilling me up to this point? No. Oh, we've just been chit-chatting. Uh, and I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to slightly modify some of the questions that I've asked you in the past so that okay. you're, you're on your heels. And the first one is, so today is uh, what? November 5th. Is that what November it is? November 5th, November 5th. So we all voted today. Hopefully if you're an American, I don't care who you vote for, just go vote, mm-hmm. make yes. your voice be heard. Uh, but the one thing that I think majorly changed from 2020 to 2024 outside of, okay. If you want to say like grocery prices, what it doesn't matter. The one thing when it comes to political candidates running for president or running for offices, I feel like they embrace the podcast, mm, yes. uh, the podcast world when mm. it was re- really never done that much before. Like, for instance, uh, Kamala went on to Who's Your Daddy? No, that's uh, not what it's called. You're close. Is, is it better called Daddy or? Whatever the it's something like something that. daddy. Yeah, uh, something daddy. I, I'm sorry, I'm not a big listener of her show. It's not really my thing. I've listened to a couple of her episodes. Yeah, not, like, yeah they're not as big of listeners as uh Joe Rogan's either. But, yeah, yeah. But like, and I'm who's not your saying, daddy. Who's your daddy, right? No, that's not right. It's Are some, you sure? It's like you got a phone on you. I, Let's Google it. Right all right. No, no, Google right now. Do it right now as yeah, we talk. All we're right. gonna I think it's who's your daddy. I think it's called better call daddy. Hang on, we're looking this up right now. Which, to her credit, is uh, a tremendously popular no, podcast. It, it, it's, it's close to that. What's uh, it called? 
Call her daddy. Call her daddy. Okay. Yeah, that's the one. Call her daddy. And it, it's a it's a very risque podcast about sex. Better Call Daddy uh, is a podcast, though. I do is it? Yeah, okay. that's also a podcast. Yes. Uh so it's a risque podcast. It's uh they they talk a lot of therapy and sex and all kinds of stuff. And mostly women, I would say. I think uh, so. But I've listened to a couple episodes like uh I listened to Little Dicky was on it at one point, and he's one of my favorite rappers. I listened to to that one. And um, mm-hmm. uh, but anyways, uh Kamala did a bunch of uh different podcasts. And then, you know, Trump did Rogan and Trump did the other, what's the other comedian with the mustache? Theo Vaughn. Theo Vaughn. Yeah, like, yeah. Which, by the way, one of the funniest things, and I don't, again, I don't care what your views are. I don't care about your politics, all that stuff. One of the funniest things I heard from this election season was on the Theo Vaughn podcast when he had Trump on. And he's, you know, he starts to grill Trump a little bit. And he's like, you know, obviously the one thing that everybody throws against Trump is that he overturned Roe v. Wade. I don't care what your thoughts are on and all that stuff. But Theo Vaughn was like, he starts talking about Baron. He's like, Baron, he's 19 years old. He's like 6'6". He's tall, dark, and handsome. He lives in New York City. He's rich. He's a bachelor, all this stuff, right? And Trump's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's awesome, whatever, you know, doing his oh, thing. Yeah. Like, he's a great son. He's and, a good you know, son. He's a great son. He's a great son. The best <laughs> son, possibly, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and then Theo, like, he, he set it all up. And this is perfect comedian, right? Like, and then he's like, are you sure you don't want to like wait a little bit longer to reverse row Wade? Like <laughs> give, give Baron a couple years ago, you know, knock some women up and not have any recourse or whatever. It was pretty funny. That's the way it landed and Trump didn't see it coming. Right. Yeah, of course. And, and honestly, Trump missed a huge opportunity because I, I think that, you know, that podcast might've had some alternative listeners on there and a different base on there that he doesn't typically reach because sure. it, cause I think it's not really political typically. Mm-hmm. And what he should have, which he's not as quick on his feet as I thought he was, what he should have said was something along the lines of, well, I sent it back to the States to have, you know, their views done state by state, which is how I feel it's best handled or whatever. And we live in the great state of New York and in New York where it's a very liberal state. So Baron will be able to do as much of that as he wants to, right? <laughs> like he could have, like, and it would have been comedy. It would have been funny. Yeah. The video just got out again for a second. What is going on right oh, now? Oh man, I'm telling you, I got the bad vibe. That's the Kavorka. The juju. <laughs> Bad podcast, Kavorka. Anyway, whatever. Nobody's listening at this point, anyway. So, <laughs> well, you just turned everybody off. With I know, but the Roe v. Wade. But, yeah, but, but anyway, I just thought it was funny. It was the funniest thing I had heard through yeah. the political season. No, it was season. well, and it was and it was comic. Like if you are out there and if you're listening right now, and you can't realize that a comedian is there to make you laugh whether or not it's politically correct or not yeah. and that's their job then then you come on like, nah, i'm with you yeah that's just my overall theory and, and and don't take jason don't don't beat up jason over my theory but well no i think to speak to the big point here is it it shows how powerful podcasts have become and i made a tiktok video about this basically talking about i, I was looking i was looking at the numbers this is where, I, again, I even said this in my video. I, I'm not throwing allegiance or endorsements towards any either party. I really wish Kamala Harris would have taken up Joe Rogan on his he invitation. He should have, 100%. One, yeah, because I think they were, again, like the, the, the big thing against her has been that she's very rehearsed. And you go on there, that's a three-hour conversation. You can't be rehearsed. You can't, you're not going to yeah. be rehearsed there. And they were very worried that she was going to trip over her words. But you look at that platform and what it brought – 43 million views on YouTube in a week. Right. And that's Donald just Trump. YouTube. That's not that Spotify. Just yeah, Apple. that has nothing to do with the podcast. So I was yeah. just blown away by the fact that these political or these presidential candidates now have a platform where they can sit and tell their story and actually, I know Rogan made this. He said, you now have a platform to talk about complex issues in a more wide open format versus being cut off by a moderator a minute and a half into explaining the theory behind what this issue might be. And, and Rog- Rogan in, in particular, he is such a good interviewer to where he lets you have your time to say what you want and he slowly brings you back to the question yeah. and all that stuff. I think that it would have been a really good interview for her and I really think it would have helped her. In, I think so too. And in just, the election. Well, because, I mean, and this is no knock on the other part, the, uh, I already forget, better call dad. What was it called? Call Your Daddy. Call Your Daddy podcast. Yeah. 700,000 views, I think, or down, or at least that was the YouTube number. Again, n- n- not a bad number at all. No, However, not bad at all. 43 million. That, that was over three weeks. 43 million. I'm just saying if she, if she would have put herself out there, mm-hmm. I think it would have put a whole different face on her campaign. 
just my opinion. Right. But, and I don't know, but that's the, and that's the thing that that's where you go and ask like, okay, would she really have been in such a, in such a bad spot that she couldn't just have a conversation? Cause Rogan said, I'm not going to beat her up. I just want to have a yeah. conversation with her. I want to get to know her. I want to get to know her side. Right. I think it would have benefited her to put herself on that stage. And let people see her differently. Uh, she's even brought up in recent weeks that, you know, she's having trouble with certain demographics and like, the Rogan podcast has those demographics. Right. I think right. the the podcast that she went on doesn't have the like it has the demographics that was probably already voting for her, right? So yeah, like if you're gonna try, and, it. Yeah. if you're gonna try and spread your your cast, like it would have been great for her to go on to a Rogan or somebody like that mm -hmm. and get that point across. But either way, my point is, <laughs> we went down a wild yeah, rabbit hole. Yeah, that was a wide a, right turn. There. A wide right <laughs> turn. But my point is, is like what like. Are you happy to see that podcast? That, I mean, honestly, it, it might be the most powerful platform. I think so. I know I, I capped off my video by saying, I think the next step is the president, whoever wins, whether it's Kamala, whether it's Donald Trump, they should have their own podcast from the Oval Office every week. Who's the Libertarian and Green Party candidates? Do we know? Like, I don't even do they know. Have a shot I, didn't even see, I didn't even look at that on the ballot. I don't know. There was like... Four other parties on the yeah, I, I saw and they, I just like I know where I'm going with this, but, <laughs> but I think that could be because they used to do. I mean, you think back, to, uh, was it was it F, was it FDR that did the fireside chats, the old radio, yeah, where everybody would sit, all the families would sit around the radio and listen to the fireside chat. Hello, this is there now, right? Think of the people they could reach doing an Oval Office podcast. And the caveat I put on that was, this is my idea. I should be the producer here. Yep. If they go down this road, they better be calling bomb track media. As I thought of it. <laughs> uh, it was, the crazy thing is though, like, okay. So I think we have about 400 million people that are of age to vote. If I remember mm. correctly from the statistics, it's something Sounds like about that. Right. it's in that realm of people. And just Rogan alone had 43 million on YouTube. Yeah. He had like another 60 million on Spotify and Apple podcast. Yeah. And, and, and then not even talking about Vance's numbers. Vance had good numbers on his yeah. guest appearance on there too. And, so, and then um, Elon shared it on X yeah. and got another 80 million views. So you got, you got to think he probably hit close to at least 50%. Of the oh yeah. Advantage. No, that was a smart move. And the timing could not have been better. I mean, it was right at that very end when people are okay. It's not cutting time. We got to make our decision here. Yeah. And they got in front of people, yeah, in, I, in a major, major way. So I, I was, I, love it. I was proud of the podcast industry for the fact that, like, it's, it's now mainstream media, one hundred percent. It's here to stay. Do you watch CNN, Fox News? Like, I mean, very rarely. Right? I would say honestly, the only, and it was funny. I was, I was at the gym this morning, uh -huh. so I'm going back. Oh yeah, forth. yeah. That's typically the only time I watch. And I watch it election stuff. night, right? I'll watch tonight. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I love that's. One of the entertaining things you can make a drinking game out of it, whatever you want to do. But if you flip back and forth between like uh, CNN and Fox News, and just kind of see the the drastic difference as they're trying to call states and everything, because oh like, yeah, a lot of times oh, yeah. they're wrong, and then they have to bring it back and be like, oh sorry, we called that one too soon. Or it's really yeah. entertaining to see, and and they're very very biased, and it's uh, super. Entertaining. I know it's that's that's why I say. maybe once every four years I can give up a night to watch this stuff, but. I got my own yeah. show to record tonight first. Yeah, hell yeah. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try and tune into that before I go be out fun. tonight. So my friend Jay and I always have a good time. Okay. Grilling you some more. Yeah, back to grilling. We we talked last time, which nobody's gonna ever hear because it, it faulted, but uh we we talked last time about paying for it. And to sum it up quickly, you don't you're not a fan of paying for views or paying for listeners, right? Because you're gonna get a lot of scam and a lot of spam out there. Yeah. And not to mention the fact that it should just organically grow over time. You just have to have the patience for it. Well, I think you have to define how you're paying. I mean, if you're going to a link farm and saying, hey, I'll give you $20,000 or $20, $20 or $50 for 20,000 downloads or whatever, that's that's not real. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't do anything but inflate a metric. And then if. But uh, you could, in, in theory, use those metrics to sell advertisers. Yeah, sure. And then when the actual episode that they advertise on gets 10 listeners and they get zero return, they're going to be pissed. And then they're going to start telling people don't advertise on that show. Yeah. Bad chain reaction. Create a house of cards. There. Oh, yeah. big time. Or even if they get because you time. keep paying for it, even if they get 20,000 views, but then nobody orders their product. No, like that's, you know, you're yeah. if you're showing them numbers, you have to, those have to be legitimate numbers. You're just setting yourself up for a long-term disaster. I think if you're going to pay, it's better to do a paid social media strategy 
That's what a lot of podcasts do. I have a friend named Megan Shields. She has a company, Chime House Media. I'll gladly give her a shout out because she does a phenomenal job showing businesses how to do this right. Because that's something that a lot of times for a business that's never done it, they feel like they're flushing money down the drain because they don't know how to properly set up those ads to find the right people to make it achieve what they want in the, at the end. So her goal is to get more listeners, to get more people on the email list, and to get more overall engagement. And she uses the podcast content to do that. That's what paid money should be going towards. Link farms and bots and all that nonsense, that's not going to get you much. It might get you a quick little vanity ego stroke of, whoa, look at how much I got on this episode. And then just falls right back down to nothing and you're back to square one. Okay, so that leads me into my question. Right. If you were to start back, let's just say you're starting day one of being a podcaster and you have your idea and your theory for what you want to do and your expectations and all that, mm -hmm. and you have $5,000, how are wow. you spending that $5,000? That's a great starting budget. I, I would start with finding a strategist to coach me. How do I do this right? I think back to 2015, maybe this existed, but I doubt it. I just don't think there was a lot of people selling this as a service. Now there's so many podcasters that have made it. I would love to be able to say, listen, I'll give you X amount of dollars, 500,000, whatever. And you tell me what I need to know so I can do this right. Hmm. That's a big part of I'm a big, the big thing that I work on with people is building that foundation. We don't go anywhere near a microphone till we build a foundation. So you understand what you're in for and what the long-term vision is. And we're going to craft that out and cultivate it as we go. I don't expect you to have that on day one either. That's where I would start. Then I would start looking at how I'd want to have a setup like you've got. And like equipment's a big part of it. I wouldn't want to break the bank. Right. And you don't have to, but I would invest in some good equipment. So I sound good because now we're at a point where first impressions are huge. Long time ago when I first started. Not as much. And I think back to the early productions that we did, they weren't well edited. They didn't sound as good as what I would do today, but podcasting still hadn't really caught on. It was a thing, but it was still slowly coming into its own. Now you put poor audio quality out there. Somebody tunes in and they can't hear like, like you're mic'd way better than me. Yeah. You can hardly hear me. But Ian sounds like he's screaming. Like people are like, no, this is terrible. And they're out. Not to mention, uh, if you ever listen to a podcast and you're kind of interested, so you're turning it up because you can barely hear it or whatever, and then like you switch to music or you switch to another podcast, oh, and it and that get blast uh, blast your yeah. ear off, yeah. and you're like, holy shit, you know, and you turn that that knob down. That's a horrible experience. Oh, it's for, there. For I'll tell you another one. This is something a client of mine brought this to my attention. I never thought about it. So when we're recording, mm -hmm. I try to speak. I don't want to say like very slow and methodical, but I'm just trying to speak at a tone and at a pace that doesn't come off like I'm racing and I'm trying to go real fast. You know what I mean? Because he was telling me he, I had, because I have every client do a market analysis. Yep. What other podcasts exist in your air, in your arena? What do you like? What do you not like? And he said, one of the things I didn't like was this podcast it was from a person that he knew, but he was trying to listen to more content in a sitting. So he put it on one, 0.5 X. Yeah. And she already talked fast. Right. So now she's talking like this. It's just this to the point where he's like, I could hardly understand her. Mm -hmm. And so, and then he's just, so I slowed it down to the one X speed and it was still, really like she was fast, racing. Yeah. And that's something I said, wow, I never thought about that. That's an incredibly great point. I listen at 1.25. I think anything more than that, it's too fast. It, yeah, it's like, I agree. But that extra, just speeding it up just a little bit allows you to crunch that much more yeah. like content, you know? So I, I do listen at 1.25x. And mm. uh, you and I have actually talked about that before, where I feel like I'm a relatively fast talker. Mm -hmm. And I have to continue to tell myself, I right, slow down. You know. Yeah, no, I get in that. We all get in that habit when... The good thing about being an editor and, and listening back on your own podcasts and even clients, you hear things and you can say, okay, I can do better next time. Then you make the change. Okay. So you would essentially spend maybe 50% of your five grand on, on a, str a strategist and then 50% on equipment. I would probably go 20 to 25% on the strategist, probably 25% on the equipment. And then I'd have, I don't know if I'd spend the full 50%, but I would absolutely go into paid advertising. If I had that kind of budget to play with, I would start with advertising because 
it's going to deliver better results than just trying to do it organically because the internet is freaking noisy. So putting out links and and building that presence on social media, yes, it's important. And I would not, I would say, yes, I would still do that, but I would also complement it with a paid ad strategy. So I had a fantastic idea for you and it's a, it's for your business. Okay. And I'm just going to throw it out live to you. I've never mentioned it to him before, by the way, anybody listening, if you are listening. And I just want your idea on it. So I, obviously I'm, I'm big in, in the world of finance and real estate and all that stuff. And not that your service is super expensive, but you get what you pay for. You and I have had yeah, that sure. conversation, right? Like I, I hired a, a editor on uh, Fiverr at one point and she could basically do what I could do editing. And I'm just like, yeah. okay, it doesn't take me that long to edit. Why am I paying for this person? Right. Right. Uh, but with that being said, let's just say you go to somebody like bomb track media and the cost is $5,000 to get started for like a month worth of, of work and editing and whatever else. Have you ever looked into companies out there? There's a bunch of them out there that do like small business financing for your consumers. And so like, if I have a budget, uh, let's say it, what's like your lowest tier uh, not to get too personal, but no, I, know, I know you're customizable. Like for me, you're, you're really, looking at just doing editing, which can be a lot yeah. lower, but you have like a, a package, like what's your lowest package cost? Usually for season development, it's between 3,500 and 4,000. Okay, and that's, so, and that's developing usually five episodes and a trailer and then getting everything created from that. So blog posts for each episode, social media posts, so on and so forth. Which by the way, for what he's bringing to the table is a bargain. Okay. I'm telling you that right well, now. That's like when you see the content package that you get when it's done. Hell yeah. yeah. It is. Hell yeah. It's a huge bargain. bargain. But yeah. for somebody that comes in, I'm sure you have a lot of people that come to you. Maybe their budget's like 500 bucks a month, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's these, these finance companies out there. A lot of contractors use them and stuff where basically they put $500 down and then the rest of it gets financed over 36 months or whatever, no interest, or sometimes there's a small interest out there. Have you looked into that at all? I haven't. Because what I would do in that scenario is I would maybe come up with a package that's more long-term because again, your pitch is this is not a, a three episode thing, right? Oh, right, right. This is a long term thing that we're going to do. So, like, let's do a twenty thousand dollar package. It's going to cover you for twelve months. You're gonna you're gonna record this many episodes. You're gonna get whatever you know. Build the package out, and then you have that finance through a what's the green sky? I think is one of the ones. Or it's interesting. Uh, I just uh, it came into my head when I was thinking about your service, and I was like, well, you know, what would make it more obtainable for people and make it so that you could scale your business significantly yeah. larger? And you, as the business, is gonna get the initial the twenty thousand up front, and then it's finance for that business uh, over a period of time. You give me something to think about. I like, you like it? I do. Okay. I, I'd have to think of how I could potentially partner with a company that would say, I could say, no problem. Here, why don't we hook you up with so-and-so and you can finance this bad boy. Yeah, there's a lot of them. I'll give you a few of them that All I've right. used in the past for like contracting. I'm, I'm sure they would probably listen. Why not? Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. They're getting a business that's got you know, income coming in and whatever else, but maybe has a marketing budget that's so much per month. Yeah. That stick to that's it. very interesting. I like that idea. Okay. Well, All right. See, maybe I gave you something for once instead of me <laughs> just taking everything. Well, you from gave this me some delicious whiskey. I did give you delicious whiskey, but I had to have you come back a second time and record. <laughs> so anyways, that was one thing that I came like into that, my head. Man. I do. You know, and, and don't get wrong. It's not great to go into debt. And I'm one of the, like, I'm literally in debt up to my eyeballs. I probably have, four or five million dollars in debt at this point in time oh. because of all the real estate and everything. Yeah, have. sure. The funny thing is there's a, uh, a time I met with a, a local banker and she's actually a good friend of mine now. Her, her name's April and she probably is one of my listeners. So she's probably listening now. She's probably laughing. Hi, April. But uh, yeah, hi, April. Uh, I met with her to do like a refinance at one point. It's the first time we had like actually sat down and gone over things. And at the time, I mean, this was like probably seven or eight years ago. She sat down and looked at like my balance sheet and she's like, do you realize that you have over a million dollars in debt? And then I'm like, do you realize that I have over a million dollars in equity? You're looking at the wrong thing, April, you know, like what the hell? Like, and she, it was just funny. Cause that's how a banker looks at things. Yeah. Right. But yeah. in that scenario, I think for a small business to take on like 20 grand of debt to build a pipeline. And we're talking, even if they decide to stop your service after 12 months or whatever, yeah, 
they now have a pipeline of reusable content that yeah. they can continue to use over and over and over again yeah. uh, for the rest of their life. Well, and, that, and that's the idea that I try to bring to everyone about this is the podcast, of course, it's got so many benefits and so many ways it can serve you in regards to communication and discoverability and just getting your brand out there. But when you start to extrapolate all of the things built within you have so many different avenues that you can explore and it's going to give your customers exactly what you need. And you just said it perfectly. And it's reusable for years because the idea is to create evergreen content built around the fundamentals of your business. Now, of course, there are going to be some things in there that are more current, but for the most part, we're talking about the things that make up your industry and why it's important and how those things continue to build and evolve you're going to have so much that you can continue to build content around and then reuse for a number of different purposes. You're going to set yourself up for years. It's a content machine. It's really what it becomes. Yep. And if you think of it that way versus, again, this is not to the fault of anybody because I think a lot of the newer people that think about podcasting, they hear somebody say, like we've been talking about 43 million views in a week. That's the benchmark. No, that's probably super unrealistic. Right. More so for you. How can you create something that connects directly with your one target customer? More than likely, you've built out an avatar of who that customer is. So your listener profile would look very similar to that. How do you create content that's going to make that person stand up, pick up the phone and call you and say, take my money? Right. If you can create multiple ways to do that, you're going to be in a great spot. In that scenario, too, like if you think about it, let's just say I'm a... Okay, use me as an example. I'm a real estate broker. And my main business is building my real estate company. Mm -hmm. So let's just say I hire you and we build a podcast up for my, my business and my brokerage. And I get in that 12 months, it cost me 20 grand or whatever. I get one agent ends up being a solid producer. I'm going to make my 20 grand over and over and over exactly. again every single year as long as that agent's with my company, right? Yeah, no, that's a great way to justify it. Look at what you are selling and if it all aligns one sale could justify the expense of creating a podcast and all of a sudden you you start rolling that snowball downhill you're going to pay for it over and over and over again and that's that's how you have to look at it you have what am i selling how much am i selling it for how many of these sales would i need to generate from my podcast for it to make sense yep Figure that out. You're going to be in a great place. And you and I talked a lot about monetization and uh, you came up with something that I kind of took and then kind of grew up, uh, grew further into it. And it's something I'm going to start rolling into my podcast. It's like, instead of me worrying about like monetizing, getting advertisers for my podcast, maybe I'm just going to put small clips of like my book and my real estate brokerage and other things mm -hmm. within my podcast so that mm. When somebody's listening, if they're getting good content, they're going to get a sales pitch from me. And if I sell a couple books and I get an agent here, or there, or whatever, it's going to, you know, now I'm not, I'm not worried about getting a certain listener base so that I can get monetization. I'm creating my own monetization. Yeah. And that's what I think one of the big, I think it's more of a misconception about podcasting is that the only way to have the only way to monetize is through advertising and sponsorship. That's just one way to do it. And there are multiple ways that you can make that happen. I think the sponsorship route and, and getting brand partnerships is much more lucrative than trying to do ads because if you're just specifically doing ads, it's pennies on the dollar. So unless you're getting thousands and thousands of downloads, it's hard to make that justifiable. But if you get a sponsor that's willing to grow with you and they're willing to support your cause because they believe in your message and maybe they sponsor a season or you create a package that they're not only involved with the podcast, but they're also part of the YouTube and the email. Like there's a number of, a number of ways to structure it, but you can monetize that way too, but it's only one way. There's a number of things that you can do to make money from your podcast. It's just pinpointing what makes the most sense for you because you're, you're a real estate podcast. You start running ads for fishing equipment. More than likely your audience that's tuning in for real estate advice and real estate insight is not thinking about, buying a, t you know, a rod to go fly fishing with. So they're probably, it's just misaligned. So they're not going to buy that. However, if you were like, Hey, my favorite real, and you talk about it consistently. My favorite real estate book is rich dad, poor dad, right? Which is a very popular mm -hmm. real estate sure. book, right? Or business book in general. And then you say, Hey, the link is in my show notes and it's an Amazon affiliated link where you're going to get a small commission on it. Yeah. I mean, little things like that, even if you're making, 
20 30 40 dollars you know like and that's it just, goes a long it, way it's, it's realistic expectations of what kind of money you're going to bring in if you're, if you're thinking millions of dollars are coming because you have a because you have a podcast that's silly <laughs> because if you, everybody that. would start a podcast if it just generated money like that right you, you have to you have to put the work and build the audience mm -hmm. continue growing not that it's impossible to make a million not dollars. at all no it just is like, going to take a long time like i said joe rogan's most recent episode was 2223 yeah. 2223 episodes deep unreal that's a lot, that's and, a lot. and and that i mean you think about that if you did one a week <laughs> I mean, that's 52 a year just you guys do the math. I mean, it's, right. Yeah, he's pretty, doing three or four weeks. Exactly. And his are three or four hours. Right. Like yeah. he, had, he, he is in a zone that I don't think, because a lot of people say that I, or I talk to people that want to do guest appearances and that's all I'd like to be in Joe Rogan. I'm like, cool. Can you sit and hang for three hours? Cause that's what he's going to do. He's going to grill you, but you also have to build up the street cred for yeah. him to want. Yeah. Why the hell does Joe Rogan want yeah, who, you on? Well, the that's show, it. Right? Like, how the hell I would never be on that show. If he ever invited me, sure. But I'm not sitting here like, well, that's the goal. Got to wait until Joe Rogan because that's not happening. But if you were, I'd rather be on the even Ian Hoover show, right? If you were to build relationships up with local podcasters that are or online podcasters that are within the same space, like I see with tech, you, I'm a big techie, so tech mm -hmm. YouTubers are always like working together to do. Well, stuff it's a collaborative industry. That's one of the big things I love about podcasting is it's such a collaborative community. But you also have to stay in your lane, and you just can't expect to. I, I always, that's another, you know, to reverse engineer things. I say, okay, what if Joe Rogan did bring you on the show? What happens? Your life changes overnight. As long as you bring some kind of. Are you ready for that? Quality content. Are you ready? I would that? crush Rogan. Okay. Ready. Well, I'm not, I'm not asking you. To speak. Yeah. That's typically what I ask anybody. Like, are yeah. you ready for that? If it were to happen, no. are you set up for the success that could potentially come from that? Or what if you choke me? You know, you'd see these people that plan for months and months and months and go on Shark Tank, and the second they start, they, they go, oh, yeah, they, uh, they bumble. They bumble and, and, I mean, it's just like I mean that that's rare, and yep. I, it, it's, it's actually academic. not. It's probably rare. not rare. They, they just don't. Tell, out, I say they yeah. don't televise all that. But that the whole thing is okay. That's the if, in podcast terms, that's probably the biggest stage you could get on. Yeah, you got to be ready for that. Yeah. That's kind of the weird, scary part is that like I'm so overconfident in myself that I'm like, yeah, I cry. But well, but in the grand scheme of things, when I actually get there and then my heart starts pumping, because like I've spoken at Inman, you know, with a couple hundred thousand people watching and stuff like that. Like that's uh, you know, that's probably the most nerve wracking thing. And I still had the heart pumping and yeah. like the adrenaline and all that. I'll tell well, I I I never got close, but I'll tell you, I have a friend. I've done some work with in the past, but he, he he's the business he has. It's not even worth trying to get into what he does. He just know he makes millions of dollars doing it. Him, he was a guest on my show. And we hit it off. We just got along real well. So we became friends. He's a big whiskey guy, just a dynamic dude. The work he does, it, he was, he had a, a podcast guest booker that was working on getting him on Rogan. It was, ha it was in talks. And I said, I, so if that happens, can I come? <laughs> Yeah, let me just be your way. I, I, I was like, I don't want to do I just want to come. I just want to yeah. come. He goes like, hell yeah. He's like, I'm, I'll fly you down here. I just want to come. I want to see a studio. I, like I, said, I just want to hang out. I don't want to out. expect to be on there for more yeah. at all. I just want to come and see and meet Joe Rogan. I thought that would have been cool. So that's probably the closest I ever came. And then that never materialized. Yeah. Oh, well, like I guess I didn't sit on the edge of my seat waiting for that, but it would have been a cool experience. Now the hard question. So I gave you the easy question of what would you do with five grand? What would you do if you had two nickels to rub together? Like you, you have barely any money, but you're like, you know what? I'm really feeling this podcast is like going to do it for me. Mm. And I know it's going to take hundreds of episodes or whatever. I'm just going to go do it. Yeah. What would you do? There, There's ways to do this on a shoestring too. And it's, again, I start with the mindset and the strategy. That's free. You, you don't have to invest thousands of dollars into understanding that you're doing something that's long-term. It's not a short-term, Hey, we'll put a few episodes out there and the world will change. What is my message? What can I do to bring it to the world? I think if I had just a few bucks, the first thing I'd buy is a, a serviceable microphone that I could plug into my computer. You ha do you have one that, you know, that serviceable? there's, I can't remember the exact, it's I think it's Samsung Q2U, I believe is the mod. It's like 60 bucks. That USB microphone. It's a USB microphone. You can plug it right into your computer. It's pretty You're, solid. Good to go. It works. Yeah. It serves a purpose. Like obviously you've upgraded big time. I've upgraded with my mic, but I didn't start with 
high level mic. Yeah. We just we we got equipment to get the ball rolling. Yeah, we started with a uh, snowball mic. There you go. I mean, a lot and a lot. It's terrible, but a lot of people have. Yeah, I mean, it was it was okay. There's some background noise or whatever. We didn't know. He's picked up. You didn't. No, no, I knew. knew. I just I had a I have a cheap partner. I would like, dude. This took (laughs) four years of me telling him like we need a fucking studio. Yeah. To get to this point, (laughs) and like even still, he he doesn't know the amount I spent on the studio, right? Like, yeah, I don't think he'd be super mad at me, but I think he knows a ballpark, you know, but. it could know if he it doesn't does. listen, so I don't have to worry about it. But well, you gotta think so just the mic so like okay, you think this is a hundred dollar microphone. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a road microphone, it's got a built in pop filter because yep. we have horrible sound quality in our office. So I thought instead of trying to spend money putting like sound up. barriers, yeah, like, panels and it's, stuff. It's right. better just to get a microphone that's not gonna pick up the background Makes noise. Sense. So I did a lot of research on that. But you gotta think the cables are twenty five dollars uh-huh. a piece, the soundboard was like Six hundred dollar board, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the to get a quality laptop that could, you know, although it's fucking up now, but uh, to get a quality <laughs> laptop that can handle editing, you're looking it's probably seven eight hundred bucks. Uh-huh. This is an older one I had laying around, but it still works good. Uh, the lighting, the cameras, seven hundred dollars. The lighting was probably a hundred bucks. Like mm-hmm. it all adds up. You're spending three four grand to get a quality space, but you got to start. You got to like. That's where a lot of people get screwed up. Yeah. Because you, they think that's where you have to start. If you your know? budget's 50 bucks, find the best microphone you could give for $50. And, and, and a lot of podcasters record out of their closet. Uh, yeah, you said that before. Mm-hmm. I, it's so interesting. But you think about it, if If you have a high-end cell phone, like an iPhone or a Galaxy S24, the quality of microphone and uh, camera stuff like that on there are are pretty solid now. It's gotten a lot better, and and that's I, years ago I would have recommended against using an iPhone because it just it didn't sound great, but you could get by. Yeah. So if you literally wanted to start a podcast and you just used your phone, technically could get by and and make it happen. So there's really the only barriers that you're going to face is the ones you put in front of yourself. And a lot of people will say, well, until I can afford to get that $250 microphone and all those nice gadgets, and uh, I just, I'm not going to do this until then. It's not about that. It's about the message that you're bringing. To start, the world. start a GoFundMe. Do, do something, right? Like, well, just what you think about get, it, though. Like, get the small mic, get, get that $60 microphone that plugs into your computer. Don't worry about the, the roadcaster. Don't worry about the fancy cameras, just use what you have at your disposal. MacGyver the shit out of it until you have but you, you a just, budget. You laughed at me there. I'm dead fucking serious. Like, think about it. You, the biggest problem for brand new podcasters, they don't make it past three episodes, right? Mm-hmm. What's better than creating the pressure? Let's just say 50 people, you know, donate 50 bucks or 20 bucks, whatever it is to, to your podcast. That right? would be, that, hey, I'm and, not, that's and, fun. and your sales pitches, I'm going to record at least 50 shows or hundred shows. I'm, you know, with this and I'm going to, if I make any money, I'll pay you back. Whatever your pitch is. Right. Yeah. And you start a GoFundMe, which by the way, if I saw somebody I know create a GoFundMe, I would a thousand percent throw 10 or 20 bucks on it. Just I think that's a great somebody. idea too. That's, you know, that's something they don't talk about a lot. I, yeah. I think we should maybe talk about that more. And, I think and, that's a great idea. And the, the problem with podcasting is people aren't making it long enough in it to see the re- reap the reward. Well, that's, it. that would be the flip side. Is, it, right. is this a con job to get me, get everybody throws money. All of a sudden you got a thousand dollars and you never start. Well, it has to be somebody, you know, and, and they got to throw the goals out there. But for me personally, like, like if you were to be like, Hey Ian, here's a thousand bucks to get your podcast up and going and you mm-hmm. gave that to me or a bunch of people gave me a thousand dollars. If I only recorded three episodes, I would feel like That's the it. biggest asshole on the face sure. of the earth. Oh, I just I... stole your money, mm-hmm. bought a podcasting setup, recorded three episodes, and then I decided I was done. That's what said. I was saying at the top of the show here was that that shit's embarrassing because you're probably going to spend a lot of time backing up why you're doing this and then promoting it. And then it's going live. And then it's like, is it crickets? Is it just a few people? Is it just not the expectation you had? And again, it's silly to set an expectation like thousands and thousands of listeners on day one. It's just, even if you have a big audience, I mean, the only way you're probably going to pull that off is if you have a massive following as a celebrity. Right. You know, Taylor Swift could start a podcast tomorrow and have millions of listeners. We're not Taylor Swift. We don't have that kind of audience. So, However, no. if somebody 
donates 20 bucks to your GoFundMe, you think they might listen to your show? I would think so. I mean, yeah. well, and that's the thing for me, I'd feel a personal obligation. I feel that way whenever somebody gives me money. So, you know, being in business and being an entrepreneur, whenever anybody has ever paid me for the service I provide, I take that very seriously. And I've always considered myself a person that would put their needs above mine because they're seeing something in what I'm telling them and they're willing to invest their hard earned money in that. I owe it to them to give them what I told them I deliver. Yep. And, and I, if I fall short of that, I'll own it, but I will find a way to make up for it. And very seldom do I, because I am huge on communication. To me, that's the foundation of everything, especially when you're running your own business. And if I'm not properly communicating with my clients, learning what they want, I'm doing them a disservice. But by them communicating back with me and keeping those lines open, it allows me to deliver exactly what they're looking for. And I don't paint any re unrealistic expectations because it would be an asshole move of me to say, oh, yeah, dude, sign up with me. I'm going to get you thousands of downloads and we're going to do this. And then, no. That's what so many people do. They, and you're they, right. They over promise and under deliver. It's so and sad. They don't care. They, they got something in their contracts that they don't guarantee <laughs> results or something. And it's, 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 no, it's, really it, sad. And, and that's why I think it scorches the earth in a lot of ways for the honest business people because they've been burnt by somebody that's, oh, yeah, we'll get you this, this, and this. And then they vanish. Or they treat them like crap. I actually was talking with somebody the other day that was telling me that one of her clients had another service provider they were working with tell her she wasn't important enough to get the project done at a certain point. How could you ever say that to somebody that's invested in you? As, like in that, And that's the world we live Slap in. That, in the face. Oh, that's absolutely obnoxious. Yeah. If anybody ever did that to me, oh man, I don't know what I'd do. That That's just the epitome of absolute bullshit. Reading or audiobook? Audio. Okay. I mean, duh. It's kind of <laughs> kind of engrossed in the platform. What's your favorite audiobook? The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Actually, you know, I'll take that back. My favorite book is The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. My favorite audiobook, Relentless mm. by Tim Grover. That book, have you ever read it? You gotta text me both of those because I I've okay. never I've never read either one of those. Tim Grover is the trainer. He was the trainer for Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Dwayne Wade. And I can't remember the, uh, the not, or the, uh, what do they call it? Was he the guy that was in Michael Jordan's hotel room when yeah. he ordered the pizza? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. He That's was, he was on the 30 story. or on the uh, last dance documentary. Yeah. yeah. But the, the person that narrates the book, the narrator, I was like, why can't I think of this word? I can't remember his name, but good God, is this guy motivational? You just listen, like, every, you get done with a chapter and you're just like, I can run through a wall right now. This is so good. Like it's such a powerful Tony book. Robbins narrates his own books and that yeah, just you just get that fucking yeah. yeah. Like anybody that yeah. can do that well on uh, stage, if they can transfer it to a book, that's that's amazing. It's interesting the way you said that favorite book versus favorite audio book, because there's a huge difference. Like for instance, like reading versus audiobook. There's some books that I absolutely cannot read to save my life. Mm -hmm. But then on audiobook, I have no problem with it. Like uh, the yeah. four-hour work week, for instance. So dry to read it. Yeah. But then listening to it, it's like it's not as big of a chore, right? And I think it, 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 a lot of times comes down to the narrator. Because there, there was a couple audiobooks that I was looking at on Audible. And I it was it was you could tell it was AI. Yeah. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this. There's no way. Is that a thing now? I've, I've yeah. Been, I haven't done audiobooks in a while. I've been trying to read. No, it. I, it, it is. And I get it. It's obviously easier, easier than paying somebody, but you lose that emotion. You lose the, just the overall oral dictation of a human voice being able to inflect and, and, and bring a vote emotion to it. It was just this robotic monotone. Th I'm like, ah, oh, there's no way I'd get through this. Why is, why even spend the $15 on this is going to be miserable. The, the funny thing is, so I guarantee one of my listeners is my mother. Uh, and I love her to death. And she's the reason I am who I am. I mean, her, my great grandfather, my uncle, I got a couple people in my life that are just really, that's awesome. Huge, uh, you know, reasons why I'm here today and where yeah. I'm at. However, she drives, drives me a little crazy. No, no doubt about it. I love you, mom, but you drive me crazy. And I'm sure I drive her crazy. It's just, it's part of family, right? Sure. And, but the one thing, one of the memories that I remember from a child is her reading Harry Potter to me. Yeah. 
And she had different voices for all the characters. Ah, uh, she was fully all in. That's she was all I'm in. Doing. Different. And I think she read like the first three books to me. And then, then they started coming out of movies. I just started watching the movies instead. Yeah. However, I had a real hard time in the first movie because the voices did not match my mom's voice. <laughs> that's... So it took a little while to, to think. Yeah, about. I could see that. Yeah. So it's uh, it's interesting. But yeah, it's uh, the little thing. And that's, yeah, I think about that. Like when I do stuff with my kids, it's like, they're going to remember this like, yeah. 20 years from no, now. I me and my daughter actually had this conversation recently because she's going to be 15 here in a couple months. And I used to read to her at, before bedtime and she kept getting, as she got older, I kept saying to myself, this is eventually going to be ending soon, but it went far beyond what I thought it would. So I just kept going. As she asked me to read to her, I said, sure. And, and then all of a sudden it happened. The one she's like, I'm just going to read myself tonight. I'm like, oh, there it is. Yep, there it is. And we talked about that because she says, like, yeah, you used to read to me a lot, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, because I knew eventually you're going to tell me not to do that anymore, and I didn't want to. I was just going to soak up as much of that as I possibly could. My my daughter, do- both my daughter and my son, both want to be sung to before bed. My mm-hmm. daughter's going on 14 now. She oh, yeah. wants to be sung to same wow. song every night. Wants to be sung before bed, and like. I keep thinking to myself, like, she should really have grown out of this already, but I'm I'm just cherishing it, right? Sure. And then the other thing is she's still to this. She when she was two, I think, she bought uh, an Abbey doll from Sesame Place in Philadelphia. Uh-huh. And she still to this day carries that Abbey doll like anywhere she's gonna sleep because yep. she has that uh-huh. when she sleeps. And like so she's so grown up and so mature, but then she still has her Abbey I, doll at night. I think that must be something from that generation because my daughter's the same way. She's got uh this little bunny that we got when she was a baby, when she was first born and a blanket that it's just like this silk blanket. She, every, that's what she still sleeps with to this day. And, and that's because I only, you know, sometimes I'll just kind of poke a jab at her just to sit, you know, just for fun. But she's like, I don't care. She, she doesn't give a damn that I'm, she's like, no, yeah, that's what I want. They don't give a fuck what we do. No, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> why, why are you making fun of that? And that's her thing. Now. She's like, why are you making fun of that? It makes me happy. That, that poor Abby doll too, man. That thing's been puked on, peed on. The yeah, head's no. been sewn back. Oh yeah. This thing, or this thing was like as white. Her, her, her body was <laughs> as white as like the outline of your text here. And now it's Is like it the color of the table. It's just so. Yeah, Abby but, Cadabby's like, African you can wash it now. Yeah, yeah, you can 100%. wash it as many times as you want. The washer just like, I. sorry, man, I can't help you here. Abby Cadabby crossed the border illegally at one point. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, far down rabbit holes. We just, really have spiraled I here. I do. You're like, I'm never doing this show with this guy ever again. Uh, I had one other question I was going to ask you, and I'm drawing a blank on it now. Must have been a good one. It was a really good one. I'm going to remember it afterwards. Of course. That's how it always goes. 100%. Okay. Well, anyways, if you had to do one vacation you've never been able to do, what would it be? Italy. Italy. That's the top of my list. Yeah. I've never been. And being an Italian, I'd like to check that out someday. You kind of look like an Italian. Thank you. I got a little bit of that vibe going. It's like I'm only a quarter Italian, but it's definitely dominant. Dude, we we come in. We just got to Atlantic City this this was like last weekend, right? We just got to Atlantic City. We got into our hotel and we called the elevator. And this elevator, standard size elevator, not big at all. And when the elevator door opens, there is got to be 40 Dagos that just come <laughs> rolling out of this elevator. And they just kept coming. And we're just like, how big is this elevator? <laughs> and then we walked in the elevator. We're like, there's no way all those people fit on this elevator. How did that happen? They had to have been on each other's laps or something. Yeah. I don't even understand how it was. <laughs> it was hilarious. I, That's I, awesome. Yeah, I'm not. Those a, are my people. I'm not Italian. I wish I was Italian because then I could like grow facial hair yeah. and like, you know, all that stuff. But and have a really cool, like, I'm so jealous of the the voice of like in The Sopranos. Like, you know. It's the, a, yeah, it's it's fun. The gobble you know, yeah. like, <laughs> All that good stuff. <laughs> well, thanks so much for round yeah, two, yes. technically round three, if you include your uh, podcast. Yes. And I, I really appreciate everything. And if you are thinking about getting into this for your business or even just for you personally or whatever, reach out to Jason. He's a wealth of information. Thank you. And he doesn't, he doesn't even try and like sell you on it. He just wants to educate you. And and then eventually he shows you what he brings to the table. And and if you're not ready for him, he'll be ready whenever you are ready for him. That's yeah. That's the name of the game. You can't pressure somebody into doing a medium like this. You've got to be ready to take the leap. I can help you do it every step of the way, but you've got to be ready to jump. And I, I appreciate you bringing me back here because I mean, for one, yeah, the first time it was great, but this was more fun. And like I said, I, I love, I spend so much time talking about podcasting that this was a little bit of an escape. 
I mean, obviously we're doing it on a podcast. We talked about so many different things and it allows me to not just talk about podcasting. So I appreciate the invite and the opportunity to do this with you. Absolutely. I feel like we're, we're going to be in contact for a long, long time. So yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I'm a fan of bomb track media. Yes, sir. Thank you. Reach out bomb track media. What's the best way to get in contact? With Easiest you? way is bombtrackmedia.com. Just visit the website. You can connect with me in any way, shape or form from there. Oh wait, you did say something about you. You did a TikTok. Is this TikTok live? Cause you, you said you were yeah. going to get back into it. I started to, venture back into the world of TikTok. So what I like about, I will say this right out of the gates. I hate that Instagram reels are still only 90 seconds. And this, that thing that I, I did about Trump, it ended up being about two minutes and 50 seconds. And I tried to trim it down to 90 to get it onto Instagram as well. And that wasn't working. I said, well, screw it. This is just going on TikTok then. Instagram's dead. It's over. I don't think it's dead. I just, I'm at a point where I'm just tired of trying to fight with that algorithm. It was the number one deleted app in 2023. Yeah, I know you had mentioned that to me before. I get it. Like I said, I, I've had a love-hate relationship with Instagram for years. And I'm at a point now where I'm just, all I really use it for is stories anymore. Yeah, and my stories share from my Facebook. So I Oh, there I, you I, go. So you're not even only, really on there at all. The only thing I reinstalled Instagram for because I deleted it for like six months. The only thing I reinstalled it for is because I had multiple people tell me they sent me messages. That's, yeah, that messenger thing. So I I literally yeah. just check my messages on it. I have a few people that I only talk to through instant messenger on Instagram. Yeah. So I just have it there. It's it's I don't have any shame in admitting every now and then I'll get sucked into a rabbit hole on the either on the stories or on the reels. I think we all fall oh, into yeah. that from time to time, but Absolutely. I've been trying to get into TikTok. but yesterday I got on there and everything was political. I was like, I can't, I can't, I'm just, I'm so inundated and yeah, it'll be over tomorrow. Oh, it will be. Well, and, okay. Maybe, well, maybe. It'll, it's going to take a minute yeah, to filter maybe out, but no, but it was just all this user generated content. I was like, you're, you're, these people, what are these people going to talk about? You're not a political pundit. You don't work for CNN or Fox news. Like once the election's over, what, What's your life going to be? This is all they're talking about. I'm looking at these people that are like, have like committed to being this just supposed wealth of information about the election. I'm just like, who gives a damn? Like, you used to be a porn star. Now you're firing out. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> well, they're still, yes. I you're going to go back to being a porn star. I minute. guess. Yeah, they're going to be throwing out their OnlyFans. You know? I mean, no, I'm, so. I'm not ripping on how anybody makes a living, but I'm just like, why all of a sudden am I supposed to care? Listen, if I could make bank by doing videos like that, I would not be on a real estate broker. It's well, not way doing, more fun than selling real estate. They're not even making videos. They're just sharing shit. Yeah. So it's not fact checked. They're just, ooh, this resonates with me, so it'll resonate with everybody. And <laughs> uh, now I've, I've opened up Pandora's box. Let's let's wrap this. I up. did it like three times, so you finally did <laughs> one. Try to I, I, I try it. to keep up with you. Bro. I love this it. Is good stuff. <laughs> good shit, Jay. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having for a me. Second this time. is great. All right. Yes. With that being said, we're signing off. Have a good day. Go vote. See you, buddy.